Hey everybody, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me. Guys, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, comment below. All those things send my channel out into the algorithm. And it truly has been helping over the past several months, just taking a few seconds out to say that. So thank you guys for participating, commenting, that kind of thing. This really helps. All right, so today we're not doing dreams, prophecy, revelation, or inspiration. I'm gonna share a testimony, and it isn't a good testimony, so I'm not classifying it under my new series, Time to Testify, for that reason. But I just wanna share my story because there is a lot of this being exposed right now, and I believe the Lord's encouraging me to share this story um, to help open eyes to the process of how this is done, okay? Um, I honestly don't want to share this story because, um, not, not because it's so personal to me, but I don't know if you've ever had someone who you loved, who maybe did some, some bad things, messed up, and you know God loves them too. And they pass away and it's almost difficult to talk about the bad things that that person did because it's like it has been washed already. And it's like um, you're holding, you know, some, like old things have been passed away, you know, already. And so it feels strange. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but this man that I'm going to talk about has passed on, okay? He passed on over a decade ago. I'm not, I'm going to try to not mention his name just as some point of uh, reverencing God and his forgiveness, not necessarily this person, but the Lord himself, um, and try to be gentle about the situation as much as possible. But I do want you to know that I already forgave this person. I forgave this person before they died. Uh, but something powerful happened before this person died. We lost contact for several years, and I'll get into the story as to why. But um, one night I had a dream that this man came to me and apologized for what he had done. Um, and he told me there were some things that he needed to work on, whatever that meant, right? Well, like I said, I lost contact with this person. Three days later, someone who used to attend the church this man pastored and that I attended and led several ministries in, um, contacted me and said, I want you to know that pastor such and such has passed on. Okay, so obviously when he passed on into the next life, there either the Lord himself shared that with me so that I could have closure, or I literally saw this man come to me in a dream and apologize because there were things that he had to take care of before whatever, okay? And I'm not here to get in the ins and outs, but I'm telling you, it's quite random and quite strange, and I doubt that the devil would make this man apologize to me. So I believe God's hand is at work. And the more that I know about dreams now, because at the time I did not know that much about dream dreams, but I had been a dreamer my whole life. Um, I know for sure that that was a God coloration dream and it was tested, tried and true. So whatever the message is, that man did apologize to me. But prior to that, I had already forgiven him of the things that were obvious. Although come to find out a couple months ago, there was more to the story than I understood, okay? Um, so just kind of a backstory. I was probably about 19 years old when I met this man and I come to this, this church, it was a certain denomination, and they were having a uh, transition in pastors. <laughs> this happens to us a lot. I don't know why. Um, it's like every time we find a church, oh, they're going through a pastor shift. Okay. Well, at the time I didn't have my husband. Um, and so it was just myself as a young person. And um, I started attending this church. Someone had invited me and they're having a pastor tran uh, transition, you know, changeover. Well, this guy came and him and his wife had just gotten back from a missionary trip in the Philippines. And he had got bit by a some sort of insect that gave, gave him a flesh eating disease in his leg, right? So it's just this huge deal. He's our new pastor. Everyone's praying over this guy, like, please get better, you know, all this, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, he did, he lived through it, didn't have to amputate the leg, that kind of thing. Well, because of the shift over, people leave, you know, and you got to have new staff, new leaders. And so being a young, uh, energetic person who loved the Lord, very servant hearted, I took on several ministries there, became literally, I mean, one of the right arms of this church. Um, and this man took me under his wing as if he was a dad type figure to me, which meant a lot to me because my dad and I don't have a great relationship. That is not to say my dad hates me or I hate him. There is no unforgiveness or anything. We just didn't have a close relationship that I would have loved to have an experience with a dad in my life. Um, until I my parents divorced when I was 10. Prior to that, sure, I might have been daddy's girl, but I don't have a lot of memories in that area. Um, and between 10 and, and 14, life was crazy. And with the divorce and that kind of thing, and around 14, my dad moved very far away. And I still did not have that closeness, especially then. And my dad was never an a, a affect, overly affectionate dad. Um, in fact, even like feeling, making you feel, you know, special or honored or that kind of stuff. He wasn't the type of dad to like even remember your birthday. <laughs> sometimes, you know, sadly. And again, I have nothing against my dad. I have the best daddy I could ever have, and that is my father in heaven. And he has been an amazing father to me over these years, okay? But during this time, as a young person, I didn't have that fully established relationship with my father in heaven and I was still lacking in this area. Didn't know it, but I was. And so this man played the role of not only a spiritual leader in my life, but also a dad type figure, okay? And he would, I mean, take me to go get my hair done. Now granted, never alone. Um, I had a best friend that was around the same age as me and another friend in the church around the same age as myself. And he would take us all out together get our hair done, um, you know, <laughs> buy us things, um, spend lots of time with us. Um, he would, I mean, I had gone places alone with him. One time he took me to buy a brand new car. Um, the car that I was using driving back and forth miles, I commuted miles and miles to work, was not being a great car. And he took me to his favorite car dealership and worked a good deal and even put some money down on a car for me, okay? Um, there was a lot of things that looked normal on the surface that now I look back on that I'm like, yeah, that was weird. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. Um, and, and so while he did these things with me, for me, he did them in the company of others, but I was his favorite, if I can say that. I, I knew I was his favorite and I loved being his favorite, okay? And so a lot of this stuff happened, like I said, and, and I just felt for a long time like this guy, he, he's just a dad to me, he has a wife. But let me tell you, a lot of times, his wife was not there, nor was she involved in the process of making the decision of putting money down on a car for me or getting our hair done, <laughs> those types of things, okay? And so that is number one red flag, okay? If we're gonna label red flags, I just wanna put that out there, right there. Um, and at the time, I didn't see a problem with that because I felt strongly that this man only saw me as a daughter type figure in his life, okay? Um, I saw him as a dad type figure, he was just, a, a dad to me. I mean, he, you know, he rolled out the red carpet for me a lot. Again, at the time I was like eating it up. Now I look back and I'm like, <laughs> okay, that was a problem. Okay. Um, I preached in this church many times. I mean, he gave me the pulpit. Um, I headed up several ministries, guys like this. I mean, I was one of his right arm people, honestly, um, probably his right arm. His wife ended up getting really sick and she was out of the picture for a long time. And guys, let me tell you that this is a tactic that I have learned of the Jezebel spirit, okay? As I look back at, the, at what took place in this church and I've seen this exact thing happen in other churches, especially in leadership, this is a tactic of the Jezebel spirit, okay? She will first prey on the weakness of the man the leadership, 
and then she will find a way to get wife out of the picture, whether through depression, whether through an illness, something like that, some way to get her out of the picture so that she can create an, an inversion and, and, and put the people next to him, to the pastor that she wants there so that she can end up doing some gross stuff and later just destroying the church, okay? Now, I just want to be clear right up front. I never did anything with this guy, nor did he do anything inappropriate with me. However, the Lord revealed to me that had things not have changed, it would have went that route, okay? Towards the end, I, and, and guys, listen, I would never accuse this guy of this. For years, some of the things that, that had happened during this time, I was like, it, it made no sense to me. Even with forgiving him, I was still, like years later, look back and be like, why was he so upset about that? Why did this end this way? What, what was the deal? And it wasn't until <laughs> a couple months ago, I did a message on here about Mike Bickle, and I start reflecting and thinking about like this grooming process that takes place. And I'm like, gosh, and I'm walking around, I'm doing laundry, and I'm just, I'm cleaning the house, and I'm talking to the Lord, and I'm thinking about this tragic situation and how this grooming takes place. And I heard that was Pastor so-and-so and again i'm trying not to mention his name okay although there could be people watching that know exactly who i'm referring to because it was not that long ago this was pre-marriage for me okay and when the lord said that to me that was pastor so-and-so i was like it all made sense it all made sense okay and so before I met my husband, and I met my husband while in service at this church. My husband knows this guy. He, he met him, did not like him from day one, okay? But I was just young and was like, no, he's like a dad to me, you know, whatever. But what started happening is his wife's out of the picture. I think he started getting more serious about, you know, we're best friends and we're hanging out and stuff. And while I say he never did anything inappropriate, there was a time when I was alone with him at the church that I felt like he was looking at me indecently. And I went home and I was like, no, he's a pastor, like well, any, anyone else, but not a pastor, right? Again, I'm in my early you know, 20s at this time, okay? And so his wife is still very sick at this time. And I even shared with my best friend, okay? And this is before I met my husband, right before I met my husband. I even shared with my best friend, I said, I said, you know, if anything ever happened to pastor such and such wife, I would marry him, okay? This is, this is how this situation ha has come. Now, granted, I would never ever have done anything and I would never have purposely moved her out of the situation or anything but this is where my mind has been groomed to I didn't even look at him in a inappropriate way but my heart loved him like a dad and needed that like you know um shelter in my life and that kind of thing and my friend said to me that's gross <laughs> And I remember it till this day. And, and I'm telling you the truth because the truth sets people free. Am I proud to say that a thought crossed my mind where I was like, oh, I would marry that man. No, it's disgusting and it's a vulnerable thing to share, but I'm sharing it so that someone else can be set free by my vulnerability and me being brave enough to share the truth, okay? So this is how this situation is being cultivated. But then God does something. God sends me my husband, okay? And that throws a whole wrench in this situation because not only do I believe this spiritual stuff is putting these thoughts in my mind, right? Two plus two equals four, and so it must be meant to be, and the wife's really sick, and I mean, almost dying, literally. Um, and so he's thinking probably too, wow, I've been grooming this relationship. I'm finally gonna get what it is that I'm after. And God sends me my husband. All right, so I bring my husband to the church, or at the time he was my boyfriend, okay? Uh, we're dating, and I bring him to the church. Remember that this man is a dad to me, okay? And I am excited about 
sharing this concept of look what the Lord's doing in my life. Look who the Lord sent me. Like this is the one, you know, kind of thing. I bring him over to shake his hand and he is not thrilled to meet him at all. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird, you know. Um, and anytime I would mention him or I would say, oh, I'm going out on a date with David, he would literally, it was the most childish thing. He would just roll his eyes and like look over like, <sighs> and I just thought he, he just doesn't approve of him, you know, and all this, right? And so, and again, this feels so terrible to share this story, but I know what I heard. The other day two months ago or three months ago i know and the lord was saying that was so and so that it was like this is the missing piece that you've been missing all these years of trying to understand why he responded the way he responded so things start hit our, the church is falling apart little by little like people are leaving for this reason and that reason there were people in the church that said what he's doing is inappropriate i'm like what is he doing like we're, we're just friends and he, he's like a dad to me like why is that inappropriate but they literally were saying what he's doing is inappropriate but they never went any further to say why or what or whatever but there were other things sadly that this man did and he hurt a lot of people um he had a tendency to beat people over the head in the pulpit with things he knew was going on in their lives or just wanted to get his point across rather than giving a Holy Spirit revelation, which I know now, which I didn't know then um, until it came to my turn. And so the church is falling apart. We went from having a building of, you know, serving 100 people or so down to renting a, a room from a like a YMCA or something that, you know, we had like 12 people left in the church. And one day, you know, or I had come in and I had said, you know, look, you know, I had my ring on my finger. David uh, proposed to me and he turned his head and pursed his lips and did not say a word. And I'm like, why, why is he doing this? Like, why is he not okay with me marrying this guy? I just thought, you know, he's upset because that meant I would leave his church and he wouldn't have any more leadership and everyone else was leaving, you know, all, all this stuff. I just really thought that, and for years, I just thought, wow, this guy really was upset that I got married and was going to go to David's church instead of his church. And I couldn't understand, but I felt it was very spiritually mature and just, you know what, Lord, I forgive him, excused it. It was hurtful because this guy was a dad to me okay my dad was not present and i thought when i get married this guy's gonna walk me down the aisle you know kind of thing and so um i'm engaged you know i i realize that he's giving me the cold shoulder people are leaving the church and and all this and things are weird and i'm just like i don't understand i don't know why i'm even here in this place he doesn't like me anymore or something it's just he's treating me different now. Um, and so one Sunday morning I'm in church and he preaches a message that was like this. There are some of you in this room who think you're ready to get married and you're not. <laughs> and out of 12 people, I was the only person in that room that was getting engaged and getting ready to get married. Um, the rest of them were all adults and already married. <laughs> and I think maybe some small children, that's it. And I knew he was subliminally talking to me through the pulpit. And I left that day after the service was over and I never came back. Well, um, a couple like months later and my husband and I are getting, you know, pre preparations for our wedding. We got married pretty soon. I run into him at, um, oh no, I'm sorry. I sent an, uh, I sent a wedding invitation to him and his wife and they never showed up at my wedding day. And that was discouraging. It was hurtful for me. And I, I once again, did not understand why he gave me the cold shoulder, why he didn't want me to get married to this guy. Like he never said, oh, I don't think he's a good guy. Nothing like that. Okay. Um, and so he didn't show up for the wedding. And again, I want to remind you, he was like a dad to me, okay? And I felt like all that stuff could just be washed away if you would just raise up and be like a dad to me, but apparently that's not how he saw me. <laughs> so I think it started that way. And so he did not show up at my wedding. Well, a couple months after my wedding, um, because he had taken me to his favorite car dealership, 
to get my car you get free oil changes there and so i brought my car back there even though it was far away from where i lived to get an oil change well he got his car from there too and so he was there getting an oil change as well we ran into each other at the in the lobby and i walked up to him because i'm like i'm going to be the better person here even though he's a pastor and should be the better person i had to be the better person and so i went up to him and i hugged him and i said you know oh i missed you miss seeing you at my wedding and he still was as cold as could be to me just turned his head and pursed his lips like he wanted nothing to do with me and that was the last i ever saw of him and i continued to hear terrible stories about how, how the church ended up closing its doors and just one hurtful story after the next and that kind of thing the church started out great guys it really did it was going in a great direction and something happened somewhere along the line and it just took a turn for the worse um and just fell apart and i believe that to be somehow some way the jezebel spirit was let into that church okay um and so like i said for many years I walked around and I was just, I would think back on this, even though I forgave him and I moved on. And a lot of people going through this type of situation, and I know people that left that church, they got hurt in one way or another by that man that have not been back in church, that have never stepped foot back in church or have went down a really wrong path or whatever. But I had a relationship with God and that relationship with God did save me because i very well could have took this very hurtful situation I've, I've been hurt by by pastors and leaders guys many times it the my husband always says the problem with church a problem with christianity is people <laughs> okay people are human and if our eyes are on humans we are going to get hurt every single time guys our eyes have to be on christ okay and so like i said i forgave him i moved on i never let that hinder me from joining another church being in ministry that type of thing okay um i and i have even other <laughs> other hurtful stories and i'm still here and i still attend a church okay um but years went by and i will look back at this sad memory and i just didn't understand why he acted the way he acted when I said I was getting married. And um, I even remember prior to meeting my husband, there was a guy that I was interested in dating and he shut it down. And I, at the time I just thought, oh, okay, you know, maybe he uh, knows something about this guy that I don't know, you know? Um, but now that I look back and after what the Lord revealed to me a couple months ago, I realized that the reason he was upset was because he had been grooming me he had been grooming me again i was not a minor i was 19 uh, when i met him 22 ish i think when i left or 23 when i left had ran several ministries i mean long history of you know just being in leadership and being his right arm and that kind of thing okay but the situation started going a certain way his wife out of the picture um and i really believe that he had hopes that he was going to hook up with me i really believe that and with or without his wife passing on i i truly believe that just by some things that the lord revealed to me okay so it's it's something that is scary and again i'm not bringing this up to poke at pastors guys this can happen anywhere this can be a coach of a baseball team this can be anywhere okay but not everyone's just going to throw you into the hot water okay there's a process sometimes called grooming that takes place and usually it is by you know buying things and and that kind of stuff and that's what he was doing um and i've i've seen this take place and when i hear stories of how that took place you know buying earning the trust of and then pretty soon it's do you like me as more as more uh do you like me as more than a friend and then you know things going from there okay so i just wanted to share that i really feel like someone is going to benefit from that honest vulnerable story that parts about i don't even want to share guys and i like i said it just feels like crazy and strange to even share a story about a man who's passed on that i believe that god has settled his accounts already so who am i to 
open up an account. And God knows that I have forgiven him. And if it wasn't for his words recently explaining to me the missing piece that I've missed all these years that was like, oh, that's why he was upset. I wouldn't even be on here even accusing him of grooming me, okay? My accusations against him were just, he was spiritually immature and he hurt a lot of people, you know? Um, he was spiritually abusive, unfortunately. Um, those types of things. Those were my accusations against him. I really felt he just led with control. And when you lead with control, things slip through your fingers, you know? But I did not realize <laughs> that there was a grooming taking place. And, and listen, sadly... Like I said, he, he had a crazy past. He, he was, um, he, they were not shy about their past. They were on heroin. They used to be on heroin. Um, they had been saved 16 years before becoming a pastor of this church. And um, I think they both were married for 15 of those 16 years or something like that before becoming pastors. And he had been in prison before. He had been in gangs. He had been on drugs. You know, he was not quiet about his past. But unfortunately, I think a lot of those old mentalities, uh, old patterns, um, kind of things just eventually crept their way back in and ultimately destroyed the church, hurt a lot of people, and... Um, hurt myself, but thankfully God sent my husband when he did, um, because it could have been a lot worse, could have been a lot worse. So again, I'm not saying that to trash the house of God, guys, if our eyes are on people, we're going to get hurt every time. Okay. Um, I have the best daddy I could ever have, and that's my father in heaven. And he has been amazing father to me and he provides for all my needs. He's my shepherd who I shall not lack. Right. <laughs> okay. So God bless you guys, and I hope to see you in other videos.